This is a reprise edition of an episode that previously ran. You can find all of the episodes on most of the common podcast apps, or you can go to eriemusichistory.buzzsprout.com. So it's all one word, Erie Music History, and then dot, and then buzzsprout, B-U-Z-Z-S-P-R-O-U-T.com. Thanks to the JPT Foundation for their continual financial support of this podcast, and thanks to you for listening. Please rate and review the podcast on whatever app you use. It does help. Now here's the episode. All right, welcome to the Erie Music History Podcast. I'm Chip Shell, your host. And today uh, we have our first filmmaker and musician, uh, our first member of the dogs, and our first person to have their own IMDb page. I didn't notice that. I, I saw that today. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Tom Weber, welcome to the uh, basement. My own IMDb page where I'm listed as man in bathroom <laughs> two. number two. That's right. Yeah. yeah because yeah. there is a man in bathroom number one. And, and <laughs> we're talking about a movie that you did in George the 76. Romero's, John, yeah. George Romero's film, Martin. It's funny. Right. George Romero, I lived in the Highland Park neighborhood in, in, in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh right. in the mid-70s. And I was married at the time. Okay. And my ex-wife was looking, we were both film, you know, film school graduates. That's what I thought. She was looking for, she was looking for a job. Um, and somehow she found, or we found George. And at the time, George was living in, in Highland Park with his first wife, his son, Cameron, who was a, a like a toddler at the time, who's now a film director in his own right. Yeah. Um, and, and anyway, you know, we, so Joyce happened to go to work on, he had this really low budget film that he was producing at the time, Martin. And this is post Night of the Living Dead. This was well after yeah. Night of the Living Dead. Right. When he was filming beer commercials to get by, <laughs> um, okay. you know, and I mean, it was really, we're talking really very small, very grassroots, hmm. um, and, um, you know, that's, that's another whole, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's thought... another whole story. But then the movie got made and the movie came out and Joyce and I split up George and his ex-wife split up. So for a couple of years, George Romero and I were like newly single drinking buddies. <laughs> um, and his office was in downtown Pittsburgh, a few blocks away from where I worked. So right, right. I got to see a little tiny bit of the kind of the inside. Um, and then leading up to the next movie he did was Dawn of the Dead. Oh, okay. In right. Monroeville Mall. Which right, right, kind right. Of put him on the map film wise and he was really off to bigger and better things yeah yeah as a way of that now i've had a number of people and i was just they needed a guy to be uh like a homeless person <laughs> right. living in what we today would call a homeless person living yeah. in a, a bathroom of a train station right where martin after committing the first of many very gruesome he doesn't bite him in the it, neck. He does it with a like a syringe. Yeah, I fast forwarded through it, but yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it, still it's pretty. Uh, the, yeah, the the bloody scenes in Martin are kind of are kind of hard to take. Anyway, uh, but yeah, that was uh, you know so so that was my little cameo role. But you were, and it in... was basically I'm sitting in the stall, and there's a camera and George outside all i can see is the sides of the you know the, the stall yeah right and and george and george was sort of like reacting to me getting me to say different things at one point for some reason i had a like a uh crayon or something like that he wanted me to write howard hughes on the wall yeah for no for no particular reason. And Howard Hughes, and it was cut. It doesn't appear in right, the right. film. So there's no knowing <laughs> where there was. So that was my kind of uh, momentary, you know, a mo momentary contact. With... But you were in film school at the time or you had already been? Um, through... They called it back at the, at the time they called it in a lot of the departments, it was typical, the big state universities 
had radio TV film oh, programs. Right. Okay. Right. And I went to Indiana University. This was a master's program, um, Indiana Univers uh, University in Bloomington. Yep. I had always had an interest in documentary filmmaking. Oh. And at my first available opportunity, I kind of, the master's program at Indiana was a way, you know, my parents being typical middle-class parents of the time was like, well, that's no. nothing to make a living <laughs> at. You need something to fall back on. Right. You know. And you're an eerie guy? Uh, yeah, I'm from Erie. I'm from I'm from Erie originally. I'm on my father's side about four generations back. All my right. mother was a World War II refugee from Austria. Oh, okay. Where'd you grow up? Uh, where'd you go to high school? Uh, I went to I went to prep. Okay, all right. And then and I won't go into a lot of detail about that. No, nope. then that was not a. That was not a happy period in my life. Were you playing music? At but the time? I was playing in, yeah, I was okay. playing in, in small bands. So you had already, is it just guitar or do you play multiple instruments? No, I just played guitar at the time. Okay. My background in music was like classical guitar, le uh, classical piano lessons okay. when I was a kid. Oh, right, right. And at one point, you know, basically the teacher figured out that I wasn't learning to read music. I was simply, I had a good ear. I could pick up uh, the rudiments of right. the piece from hearing him play it. And I could just kind of hack my way through it on the sheet music. Um, and and I was kind of like at that point, I kind of had it with with the, piano the lessons. Structured piano well, lessons. And also, you know, this is like 1963, 64. It's like... The Beatles. The Beatles are on TV, and, man. And, yeah. and, you know, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and the Animals and, <laughs> you know, you name it. And then there was just a deluge of those, of those right. bands. The British so, invasion. So, no, it's yeah. like everybody wanted to play guitar. Right, right. So I wanted to play guitar. And my mother was like, well, if you take lessons. So I got a cheap guitar. It was a really awful guitar. And I took lessons from a guy at Markham's. Oh, okay. Who I can't even remember his name. But he was like an old time swing orchestra guitar kind of guy. Right. He hated rock and roll. And you're how old? And I was, I don't know, 12. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're young anyway. So, yeah. You know, he just, he just hated rock and roll. And he was like trying to teach me all these you know, elaborate jazz chords on this really hard to play. I mean, it looked like Woody Guthrie's guitar. Okay, it's an acoustic. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Thick. barely. Yeah, right. I, I think it was plywood. Okay, you know? yeah. Uh, but anyway, I, I, so I played a little bit and I started getting a hang of, uh, the hang of it. Uh, I bought an electric guitar from the Lafayette Electronics catalog. Oh, okay. Uh, which was a, Something like a Tysco, but a really cheap knockoff gotcha. of, of right. a Tysco, you know. Right. Um, so your first and electric. My first, yeah, my first electric. You know, I played that a little bit, and I had a crappy little amp from, um, uh, you know, whatever. Lafayette or yeah. Woolworths or whatever. Was it the same thing, like with p guitar for you, that like it was with piano? You picked up on it pretty quick on your own. Um. I, yeah, you know, the thing with guitar was once I got a decent guitar, I got a, I eventually got like a, it wasn't a real, it wasn't a Fender, but it was like a knockoff sure. of a Strat. Gotcha. That was playable at least. Right. You know, right. and it sounded, I mean, it sounded halfway decent. It played halfway decent. And at that point, I just started doing what 90% of my music development was just playing along with records oh right sure sitting in my room you know learning on uh, and off on and know, off yeah yeah learning to you know wearing out records learning to play uh you learn to play the parts and almost immediately we formed a band oh really well i mean my brother bill was a drummer oh okay and he had gone through the same kind of thing they hated the idea of him playing drums but if he took lessons and bill Bill luckily landed landed with 
Flip Bellotti as his drum teacher. Good, yeah. Flip was just a legendary guy in eerie right. jazz circles. And really funny guy, you know, almost a stand-up comic kind of guy. Right. So Bill had some very good, you know, some very good drum drum lessons and and drum experiences. And the th and the third guy was a guy Scott Uraro, who okay. was a mutual friend of of both of ours, who years later was the founding member of the band Hit and Run. Right. Right. Gotcha. And, I knew I knew and, his name. Uh, yeah. yeah, died at a very relatively young i mean in right. his 30s i think so what how old are you forming this band 13 oh, 14 so you got 15, right into it yeah you know? right. yeah i mean all of us we kind of didn't know much about playing hard you know all i knew was like the cowboy chord. Oh, I was gonna say, what do you, you know, play? The chords that are in the Mel Bay "How to Play Guitar" book. You know? Gotcha. First position G, first <laughs> position. I mean, but I mean, then I learned the magic chords E and A, and my career in rock and roll because I learned you could. They were right beside each other on the neck. Yeah, and you could just kind of flop your hand over and play <laughs> and you could slide up the neck you could go up the neck and you didn't even have to bar the cord you could do it with your thumb yeah yeah so i devised just a very sloppy way of playing you know playing guitar and the thing was i wanted to get out there and play in front of you know i mean it, this was private parties. Is that what it was? Yeah. And middle school y YMCA dances. or anything like that. Or nothing no even stuff. as nothing even as high up the food chain <laughs> yeah, right. as Wyco. Okay. But we were a band. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and and then in now in high school I got in I got in high school I got in with a different group of guys who were really a band. Um, and they needed a rhythm guitar player, so I became the rhythm guitar player in this kind of. I, well, it was almost like a Beatles what was cover band? band. I can't remember. No, okay. We had various names. We were Hudson's Individual at one time. All right. Well, you know, this was in the era of. Uh, also, I got to keep refreshing. You know, this was in the era of the Chocolate Watch Band. You know, the Strawberry the Strawberry Alarm, Alarm, Alarm Clock. The weird names. The, yeah. The, right. the, the you know weird psychedelic band names and all that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you keep playing with them in high school. Well, it, it, this was kind of you know this was kind of on and this was kind of on and off, and then some of us got together with other people, and you know the band kind of morphed in various different directions okay. so i had my kind of prep band that we would play and we played at a few like dances and prep variety show yeah yeah um and and you're just rhythm and yeah i'm just being i'm rhythm guitar okay and billy peters was the was the lead guitar player um kenny wright was the bass player kenny lived right around the corner for me and was kind of my influential buddy music buddy he was a bass player okay right. and i remember one time when beatles rubber soul had just come out that we went down to like grant's or kresge's or someplace downtown yeah. that had the cheapest records we bought a copy of rubber soul that was ours jointly. Eventually, I think I <laughs> bought my own. Or he shared it. Own. Um, and we went to his house and basically we sat down and kind of listened to, listened to side one, flipped it over, flipped it back over and started learning the song. Wow. You know? Yeah. Just because, and I don't know, that was a difficult bunch of Beatles songs. I know, that's some eclectic uh, to, stuff. To, to get into. But that was the kind of, you know, that was the kind of sound that I was into was the kind of hmm. jangly, you know, the birds. Yeah. I loved the birds. The birds were almost bigger than the Beatles in my, interesting, you know, in, in my world. Well, it was like the California thing was right. completely different from the East Coast you know, there were a lot of musical, there were a lot of musical influences happening. Right. The main thing, of course, in the, in the media was all the bands from England. Right. 
Right. And Erie being Erie, all these bands from England, I remember buying Fresh Cream by Cream yeah. two weeks after it came out for 99 cents in the in the bargain bin. Yeah. Because just nobody was listening. No, nobody was nobody was buying that. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, Erie's it it's a thing consistently over the years. Erie's taste has always been very kind of middle of the road, very sure. influenced by what's on by what's on the radio. So you play in that band for a while, and then what happens? Uh, early seventies, you, you well. Moved? Now I graduated high school in sixty eight. Okay, and All I right. went up to Boston for college. Oh, okay. And I mean, take a sheltered Catholic school kid from Erie, Pennsylvania, <laughs> and put him in the midst of Boston in nineteen sixty eight. I mean, my head did stop spinning for. Uh, you know, lots I want music. Great, lots my of stuff parents going are on. around. I can go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my first year, my first year of college or two, I didn't do very well as a student. Gotcha. But I saw every. I mean, I saw Jeff Beck. I saw the Jeff Beck group with Ronnie Wood and, yeah. and Rod Stewart. Right. Um, I saw the first show the Faces did in America. Wow. As the Faces. Wow. Uh, I saw the first or second time the Who played Tommy in its entirety. Cool. And this was in a 300 capacity club. Oh, wow. Where, I mean, I could reach out and untie Pete Townsend's shoelace <laughs> from, where I was, from where I was standing. So it was a very intimate. And I just remember those English bands being louder than anything I'd ever heard in my, right, in my life. Right, right. They all had great big, you know, they had the Marshall sure, amps sure. and the high watt amps and, and all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. So you're checking out some of the greatest classic rock bands when they're first out in Boston. I got me a job as a there was another place that came and went very rapidly called the Psychedelic Supermarket. All right. Love and, the I, name. and I worked for that guy. Anything from putting up flyers to handing out flyers on street corners to uh, I, I was kind of a, you know, roadie for the bands occasionally. Okay. Uh, I got to carry the Moody Blues equipment. I cool. got to carry one end of Sly Stone's organ that you see in the in the Summer of Soul movie. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, you know, it was a real, I mean, my eyes were, for an eerie kid. Yeah. Where, you know, Erie had a very respectable music scene and a lot of people made a living at music. There was a lot of, I mean, all levels of music yeah. from from when I was growing up, swing was still kind of in there, oh. you know, dance bands like Jimmy Minucci's Tune Toppers, you know, those kinds of bands were um buddy russell had a band and flip Pilati had a band and right you know uh so this was mario bagnoni was a big that's right he was the, a musician on, yeah. the, on the eerie music trumpet player no or... guitar player oh guitar player that's right guitar player yeah big guy in the union too yeah yeah did so are you playing guitar in boston at all i shipped a guitar and amp up to boston with me and I was playing occasionally, but I didn't get anything really regular going okay. in Boston. Now, I mean, it was a crazy time around Boston, too. It's like uh, Jerry Harrison of the Modern Lovers, later of Talking Heads. Jerry Harrison and, and Jonathan Richmond lived like the next dorm over hmm. from me. Um, and I remember Jerry Harrison as a, I mean, I could close my eyes and picture Jerry Harrison as an 18 year old. Yeah. Um, and you know, those, so there was stuff around and, you know, I jammed with various bands, but Boston was a serious enough market that there weren't, you know, there, there, I mean, I'm sure out in the suburbs where there were bands like ours that were little high school kid bands that were playing high school kid right, bands. Right, right. But, you know, in general, the music scene in Boston was so grown up and so serious. 
that there was never any really question of access to those people as, right. as players. So that must have I mean, been. Van Morrison was living in Boston at the time. You'd see him at, you know, in in the bars and, right. and, and, you know, that sort of, so it was a very, it was a very active scene. My favorite bar band to go and see was called the Jay Giles Blues Band. Okay. Yeah. And they were a jump blues, you know, they were them, but years before they became. Peter Wolf's know. with them at the time. Oh or? yeah. It was, okay. the, it was the guys. Magic that, Dick. That, Everybody's there. It was the yeah. guys who. Cool. Went on to be the, uh, you know, to be the Jay Giles, right? Um, the big touring, the big touring act. So you know, to me, musically, it's more like I wasn't playing up there, but I was having my eyes open, yeah, every day by something. Would you go there to study? I went to Harvard. Okay. Oh, okay. And I went to Harvard primarily because my dad went to Harvard. And your dad was I a mean, judge, right? I, my dad was a judge yeah. um, and a very kind of influential person around around Erie. And it was it was just a foregone conclusion. You're gonna be a lawyer. That I'm gonna be a lawyer and follow in my dad's footsteps and all this kind of stuff. And you know, a lot of my early adulthood was a delicate balance between like doing what my parents wanted me to do and doing what I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. You know, as as I look back and as I can see, you know, the one really consistent thread in my life yeah. has been music. Yeah, yeah. Every middle class kid I know that played in bands went through that same thing. Sure. With their, oh, music is fine, but it's you need something to fall back on. Yeah. Right, right. For you, it was going to uh, be law, but... <laughs> Didn't yeah. work out. What I settled on because I had worked a couple of summers at the Erie Times. So I decided I'd go in that direction. I was a like a cub reporter. Beat reporter. At the yeah. Times. Right. Yeah. But you know, anyway, so that was my pattern. I came back to Erie because I loved working at the newspaper. And this was I mean, this was way better experience than working on a school newspaper would be. Yeah, that was what I was going to do. But then my senior year at Harvard, somebody put a video camera in my hand. But immediately, you know, I saw the potential in combining my interest in reporting with visual media. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of like, well, you know, I'm going to go to school for documentary filmmaking. So then somehow you migrate back to Pittsburgh. You're hanging out with George Romero. Well, you're uh, married. Then my you... deal, I got married to my Bloomington girlfriend. Okay. And we said we're going to live wherever the first one of us gets a job. And I got a job with print media in Pittsburgh. Okay. Uh, All right. News service. Writing. So I kind of went writing yeah. news features and whatever. Cool. All right. And uh, my wife, Joyce, didn't know a lot of people in Pittsburgh. And she was a Chicago girl. And she really wanted to go back to Chicago. So we we split up somewhat amicably. And I stayed in Pittsburgh. Okay. But then kind of in the second part of my living you know, living in Pittsburgh, and this is only for like a four-year period, I met George Romero, right. and what was happening in Pittsburgh was there was a whole local scene starting up for the first time. A film? Of people, well, of, of bands. Oh, of bands, okay, gotcha. Of people right. playing their own music. Yeah. And this was, we're, this was like 76, 77. You know, the punk thing was happening everywhere. Yeah. And in Pittsburgh, there was, uh, well, the Iron City House Rockers were just getting started. Right. Donnie Iris had been there all along. Right. But Donnie Iris had already been a rock star with, with the, Jaggers. the Jaggers. Right. And, you know, he wasn't really doing much of anything until actually kind of later. Right. A band called Diamond Rio. Right. Okay. And Norman Nardini was the bass player. Oh, okay. And Norman went off and and uh, did Norman tigers. went off and did the tie. But anyway, all these bands were just happening just as I was leaving. I moved back to Erie because I was offered a job at 
QLM, oh, TV okay. and radio. Oh, they were starting a news operation, and uh, they wanted somebody with my qualifications to be a like an outside reporter. Yeah. Okay. Um, and also during that period of time, uh, a place opened on Ninth Street, Molly B. Right. Uh, the thing about the thing about Molly B's is they were bringing in Leslie West and Mountain. They were bringing in Joan Jett played at Molly B's. Okay. Um, Cindy Lauper in her band Blue Angel That's played right. at Molly B's. For a while, the bar was called Lord Bethwick. Oh, okay. I was going to ask then you. Yeah. They added them. I think they added space on to Lord Bethwick because Molly B's, when you came in, always kind of had the look of it was two different places that were pieced. Gotcha. That gotcha. were kind of pieced together. The en entryway was very strange. Anyway, Molly B's just always has a significant place to me, mainly because it's the first place I saw the plimsoll. And so you are, you come back, people who know you in this town musically think of you as someone with the dogs, obviously. Yeah, I haven't and, even gotten to that. Right, but we got to be getting close, right? I mean... Well, I, you know, this period of time, 79, 80, what, okay. what, what was happening, what got me started, I bought one of the first four-track cassette port of studio. Oh, okay. You know, there was other people around. But yeah. I was, like, running around. What I had a portable studio in a road case. Yeah. And I was running around recording bands, like, in their rehearsal spaces. Just in for their fun? houses. No, for, I mean, I was getting a little bit of money oh, okay. for it. All you right. know, the, the bands, like, I recorded the first recording of The Wiggling Judy. Perfect, yep. But anyway, the Porta Studio led me to, I had already known Jack from way back. And also, Jack played in The Frenchman with Jack Bernard. Jack Bernard, okay. Jack okay. Bernard, Good. Big Vinyl. Yep. Dean D gotcha. Gleason. All right. Man of many stage names. Right, right. Anyway. Um, I was going to say, Dean had commented that the dogs had more members than anybody over the years. Well, and... I mean, the the dogs were already a going concern. But yeah, with, the a, time. with a very revolving door yeah. kind of uh, kind of, a, of members. I remember there was a version of the dog, dogs called The Unlisted that Paul Tatera was in. Uh -huh. I don't know if you I know the name, yeah. Him. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so you, you're, but you're running around I, town. Uh, basically... Uh, the planets, the planets lined up to where the dogs had a free night. My parents were out of town. My parents' basement in Glenwood, which was the rehearsal room for a, a lot of different, uh, a lot of different rock bands. So I got the dogs in my parents' basement and recorded them Easter weekend, uh, Easter weekend, nineteen eighty-two. Okay. And, right. you know, after that, they could use, I, I went to see them live. I felt they could use some help in the live sound area. Had you been going to see them before you I recorded been, them? I had been, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, oh, yeah. I okay. mean, I so, remember going to lots of dogs gigs. Right. You know, I mean, I was, I, I became sucked into the dogs kind of through the audience. And where were they playing at that time? Um, you, you Modern said, Music Mondays. Were you know was it Oliver's or that wasn't okay? Very... The places that had the the places where the kind of modern music yeah. scene really emerged from were Sherlock's yep. and MJ's on Twenty Sixth Street, which was the winery before. Right. Now it's an antique antique store. Right. Now it's the Walker House. You're correct. Antiques. Right. Right. So they were they were the places having the Monday night. And what they'd have is like quarter drafts and a free hot dog or whatever. <laughs> and they would have, there were all of these punk bands in Erie. So, I mean, they would have like four bands. Well, that's what I was going to say. Night. Yeah. And Sherlock's would have a different four bands. So they were and playing. People would buzz back and forth between them. Would they play like an hour set or something like that? Yeah. People were playing. Most of the bands only knew an hour. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Only had an hour set. So I was friends with the dogs, yep. and I was helping them out with doing live sound for them. Okay. And then one night, there was a 
Absolutely. There was a frat party that got busted in right. Edinburgh, and Jeff, the guitar player, Jeff who just. had been downing pills, you know, and drinking heavily all night, right. hit a utility pole at a high speed. Right. I remember the next morning getting a call from Bruce. Yeah. And they sort of, well, they had gigs. They wanted to continue whatever they didn't. Originally, it was like, we don't know how bad Jeff is. Can you fill in for him? And I pretty much already had recorded them. I knew a lot of songs. I knew enough songs. They needed to, there was an opening gig, opening for the Young Swingers. Okay. Bernie White, Bill Cotter. Yeah. uh, Who were still Chicago-based at that time and they came back to Erie to do like a July like a 4th of July weekend so I mean I remember I had maybe three weeks oh, okay. to fit in with the dogs enough to play a set so you them. haven't played in a band since you were at I had or played, no you're in Indiana I you were in Blue really, I mean I hadn't played really in a band at, in an organized band at yeah. that point in a long time. Right, right. I kept playing, but I was like yeah. a bedroom guitar player. So you're playing during this time and Yeah yeah, so, you know, I've been the pressure I had been I had been playing, practicing, not in bands, you know, but I but I kept my I kept my skills up to a point. Yeah. Now the dogs at the time was Jack Bernard and and me. And Bruce. And Bruce Lentz yeah. and Bill Nicholas. Okay. Right. Bruce Lentz and Bill Nicholas were both kind of Edinburgh College dropouts who were living on the fringes of the college. So Edinburgh. that's why you guys played in Edinburgh so and, much. And, well, originally the only place that would hire us was the Halftime Bar in Edinburgh. Oh, okay. Which went through a bunch of permutations. It was the Copper Coin. Now it's Fat Willie's or... Maybe it isn't even Fat okay. Willie's anymore. But Anyways, the Evergreen eventually came later then. Yeah, we didn't play at the Evergreens at first. I mean, oh. what what Jack did, Jack booked us into the halftime on a big football weekend. And we just packed out the halftime to a scary level. Yeah. And, you know, word got around that we had done that. So, the, I mean, the, the halftime just basically hired us for every football weekend. Gotcha. You know, and and with that, we started. Now, none of the places in, in Erie <laughs> were, I mean, Sherlock's, we were kind of like too punk. Oh, okay. For, we weren't really punk, but right. we were too punk for Erie. Sherlock's was kind of into a folky, jazzy oh. kind of scene at the time, hmm. and not so much. I mean, Sherlock's changed a lot over the years. Yeah. So Sherlock's was really into more. They did not have the big house PA at the time. Oh, okay. I mean, any of the times we played there, they did not have the big stage and the big house PA. Did you bring your own? Uh, yeah, we carried the dogs. Always carried PA. No, what we what we were doing, we were playing the halftime almost exclusively. Oliver's was the first eerie place, right. and Oliver's had kind of just opened. And is uh, we're talking on French by the on Civic se- Center, yeah, Seventh and Seventh and French. Right. It's yep. the like the glass block fronted. Yep, yep. Um, I remember place anyway. That was a predecessor of the Dockside. Oh, really? Because Bob Nelson was a part owner of Oliver's. And then he sold his share and and started the Dockside oh, okay. at 420 State Street. Gotcha. Okay. Now, so after, I mean, it didn't take that long that we were drawing these record crowds we were a really popular band, you know? Yep. Well, because the dogs, the thing was, Bruce is very entertaining. Absolutely. The dogs was like, the circus was in town, you know? <laughs> People would come to see the circus. Right, right, yeah. You know, I mean, they didn't know if we were going to, uh, what we were going to do exactly. Sure. And Bruce was always very entertaining. And it was a high-energy band. Bill was a 
fabulous bass player. Okay. I mean, Bill was like a, no kidding, like a Jaco Pastorius level wow. bass player. Okay. I mean, Bill, Bill could play better not paying attention yeah. than anybody than anybody else. And Bill and I, because of it was the Who format, it was a three piece with a lead singer. Right. Everybody has to cover a lot of ground in a band like that. Yeah. So Bill and I kind of developed the way of playing together because I've never been, I've always been a much more rhythm guitar. Right. That's why I wonder. Now you're the only guy. I've always, I learned to play lead guitar. Okay. I've never been really happy with guitar solo. It, it was like, to me, there's just a fine line between like good guitar soloing and shredding, sure. weedly, weedly, you know, endless stuff that well, doesn't make any sense. What kind of guitar were you playing back then? I was playing a uh, Hamer guitar like Rick Nielsen. Very 80s. And it was, well, and it, uh, it just wasn't working with the sound of the band. Hmm. And Marty O'Connor was selling a Strat, and I tried it out. He lent it to me once to try out at practice, and I loved it. It just cut through the mix, and it, it just sounded perfect. Yeah. So I was playing a Strat. Okay. I can tell you, I, mean, I was playing a Strat through a tube Echoplex into a, into a Fender amp, Pro okay. Reverb, Twin Reverb, something like that. Pro Reverb. All right. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that was a bigger amp than than I used in later years. Um, and the PA we had belonged to some other band. I mean, we had we had two. We had a power rack that weighed 2,000 pounds. Sure. Yeah. Back then. Yeah. yeah. But we you had like a homemade sound rack back. right? made from inch plywood yeah. that weighed 300 pounds by itself and filled that with Fill that with big power. Giant in. horn. Well, you know, subs. we have big, giant EV horns. Right. And I think they're called Perkins cabinets. Okay. They're like a certain design 15 cabinet. Yeah. And we carried that all over Hell and Gone. Well, the thing was, Jack had previously been in a road band, the Living Dead band. Okay. So Jack had still some contacts in, you know, downstate. In like, you know, uh, Chambersburg, Gettysburg State College, okay, Johnstown area, you know. So we, I mean, the four piece dogs. When I first joined, I wasn't working anywhere at the time. QLN had blown up. Oh, okay. With the early days of the Reagan administration, the dogs was like my livelihood. Wow. For a while, Jack was the only one in the dogs that had a job. So you guys were started traveling. So we we traveled. I mean, we never traveled a lot. But we did a lot of weekend, you know, we yeah. did a lot of weekend gigs. But, but you know, as the 80s progressed, more and more and more places started opening up to having live music. Right. Because they'd be empty on Friday night and down the street would be like obscenely packed. Right. So, you know, we managed to kind of work that. But we were playing in the, in the early days, 82, 83, we were playing, I'm going to say, you know, every Friday and Saturday, most Sundays, and sometimes a Monday or a Wednesday or even a Monday and a Wednesday right, right. In, one, in one week. Because there were just a lot of these, a lot of these gigs. Were they all one nights or? Um, uh, when we started playing the greens, the greens was always a Friday and Saturday. Cool. Okay. Right. So once we kind of tried out and passed the test at the greens. Yeah. And that, I felt that was really our kind of home base. Right. Right. That was the place I felt was the most comfortable to play in. And of the memorable shows that we did. Most of them were at the Green. That's what I was going to ask you. What was your favorite place and where was it? Yeah, Did I mean, you feel the Greens was just... Why? You just something because about Because the Greens was like being in a... The Greens was like being in a bar in 
Mississippi or in the woods. Something. Yeah. I mean, it was surrounded Tell, by trees. Tell it people a where big it was. Old place. Well, Route 99, south of Edinburgh. Right. Uh, you can kind of see the spot if you know where to look right. now. There's a chimney there. And, I mean, it, it was a giant old, what it had been in the days of inner city trolley lines, it had been a hotel. Oh, okay. And you could walk out into the field, or you could at the time, the field on the east side of 99, uh, and you could find remnants of, you know, rails and ties gotcha. and stuff kind of half buried in the ground. Cool. So the Evergreens was like, and they had room. They had rooms that you could rent. Oh, and There okay. were people living there. You know, there were, there were these kind of like down and out redneck kind of guys who lived who lived in rooms at the Evergreens. It was family run at the time. Um, it was it was family run at the time, and the parents lived upstairs and sort of ran the place, owned the place. And Sam and Hope, the brother and sister, ran the. I don't remember okay. their last yeah. names, but yeah. anyway, they ran the place. And they were just very friendly to, well, you know, we we packed their place, you, you know, night okay. after night after night. Sometimes we would, if we had done a weekend somewhere else, there was a Sunday night gig hmm. that mostly Marty O'Connor, Frederick Martin Band, after Frederick Martin Band, I forget what it was. It was Jabberwocky okay. for a while. They were kind of pretty much the steady Sunday night band. They were a cover there. band, right? Was... Yeah. They were more of a cover band than the dogs were. Right. But the emphasis in that band, again, was on they had some really great players in that band. Sure. Anyway, uh, it just became it just became a thing. Well, so go back to what you just said about the dogs were. I thought you guys only played your own stuff. Were you mixing no, some covers? No, we played sort of distorted covers. Okay. Of, we didn't play anything exactly like... Yeah, like I Like you expected to hear. Sure, you made your to own... To get people in the early days, particularly, you know, we played Gloria. We played Sweet Jane. Gotcha. We played yeah. Should I Stay or Should I Go by the Clash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We played... Uh, uh, Heard it through the grapevine. Did you always? But do we that? always played just mutant versions sure, of the right. song. <laughs> we would never. The rule was we would never listen to the original, and we would just <laughs> kind of concoct a version of a song. And mainly, it was just in the early days while we while we needed to build our repertoire of original stuff. It was to get people to dance. Gotcha. Right, and it was right. to fill up, you know, I mean, the days of, this is almost ancient history now, the days of the three or four sets a night. Right. You know, playing that's, 10 to 2. That's what I was going to ask you. Four sets, three sets. Um, Very. It was, I mean, it was four hours. It was 10 to 2. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, it'd be like 1030 to... Uh, and and at the greens, we would always go after two. We, oh, you would. we usually went to 215, 220, 230. And you're mixing uh, those covers and, and originals in, right? It's not like yeah, our first yeah. set's all covers and no, no, okay, no, it was, it, I mean, it was a mix of stuff, okay. And very quickly, our own, I mean, very quickly, we had enough of our own stuff. Uh, during the later days, we were hardly playing covers. That's at what all. I thought. Yeah, you right. know, once well, once you build up a repertoire, and it's like songs that people come to the gig to hear. Sure, you right. know, yeah, you develop the following. We develop the yeah. following for our own music and our own songs. Which I'm really the one thing I'm really proud of with that band is that. We really, I think we took the original band thing in Erie about as far as it can be taken. And so you record a number of cassettes. I know Psycho Daddy, Apocalypse Howl. How many other ones were there? Apocalypse Howl was recorded at the Evergreens in 85. Oh, okay. And it was one of our, I was working at the newspaper again. Okay. At the time, and I had a job. I had I was the courthouse reporter. I had a beat with a lot of responsibility. 
I kind of took a took a vacation from the dark. Right, I knew you had left for, for a little while. For a while. And yeah, uh Apocalypse Hall was like our last our last gig. Oh, okay. For a while. Okay. You know. But I mean the dogs, if you talk to Jack, you know, the dogs like broke up and reformed and played for the last time. Yeah. A lot of times. I have a list here that somebody put on uh on Facebook. Yeah, and you're right. I mean it's eighty oh. to eighty-two, eighty-three, then the band breaks up in eighty-five, and then Bill leaves and Kevin Bensick takes his place and Kevin you know, off well, and on, you off know, and on. It and... was a it was a a thing about the dogs, it was a very volatile Volatile combination of personalities okay. in that band, and there was a lot of tension in that band. Not that we would have fist fights on stage, but there was a, there was a lot of sort of creative tension because everybody really cared a lot about the band and the materials, uh, you know. And and I mean, we Jack and I clashed many times over the years. Mm -hmm. You know, we. Uh, Sam Hyman. I mean, yes, Sam. Sam Hyman had a nickname for us. He called us the Hammer Brothers. Okay, because we were always like hammering. Uh, more or less, I had more to do with the creative side. That's what I was going to ask. Jack had more to do with the business side. So, when you say creative, you're writing with Bruce. Who's doing the majority uh, of it? We're all arranging okay. songs. Uh, what I meant was on the production end. Well, I was going to ask. It's like gradually over the course of gradually. Now, Apocalypse Howl was recorded at the Greens by Keith Pacheco and John Mazza. Gotcha. And mixed at their studio. Right. Uh, Psycho Daddy, we went to a guy in Pittsburgh, Dave Ernie, that the Spuds had recommended. Okay, gotcha. You know, and we, Psycho Daddy... That was the cassette era. Nobody, we right. couldn't afford CD. So we we opted to do Psycho Daddy on cassette. So, you know, about, now this is jumping ahead a little bit, but around 89, 90, we had broken up for a while okay. with Apocalypse Howl. We got back together. There was various offshoots and different things with different people. Right, right. We got back together in 86, and I had a room at Raven Sound at the time, a rehearsal room. When we talked about right, it. That okay. we, right. Uh, and so the dogs kind of moved in and had our weekly, you know, we started up again. Okay. Only Bill was long gone. Right. We had Kevin Bensick for a while as a bass player. Right. And somehow Sam Hyman and... Kevin McCleary entered the picture. Yeah, I was going to say, the band got bigger. In 80, well, yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, Sam was just such a, Sam was really a kid at right. the time. Sam was just so gifted right. that we just had to have him, you know? <laughs> I mean, we could do so much more as a band with Sam. Right, right. And Kevin, you know, added a whole kind of New York, New Jersey, East Coast saxophone. You didn't see a lot of saxophone yeah. players in bands around here. So Kevin Bensick's playing bass now. Kevin Bensick's and, playing bass. And, but before we even got to the studio, Kevin Bensick decided that this band wasn't going to make enough money to please him. So that's how Bruce came. And Bruce Hunt gotcha. became the bass player. Yep. So anyway, we wrote, I mean, we got together in, in, in a period of maybe a few weeks to a month. We wrote the songs that became Psycho Daddy. Okay. And those were pretty fresh when we went to Pittsburgh to record. Okay. Those songs hadn't been kicking around. We played them out. We played all of the songs out. To tighten them up. Yeah. That was kind of a that was kind of a rule of ours was that we really wanted to do that. We didn't want to do this Rolling Stones kind of, you know, play it fifty times in the studio and the first one that gels is the one that goes on the road. Gotcha. Right. We were kind of like because he was charging us an hourly rate and I was pretty much the way the one paying. Because you had a job. 
Well, yeah, I yeah. had a I had a good paying job yeah. at the time. Um, but any anyway, I mean, we spent four thousand forty five hundred dollars on studio time making the whole thing in that's, Pittsburgh. That's real money in nineteen eighty. Well, but we were working all the time, yeah. so I mean, we were able to pay a lot cool. of that with with gigs, right? Uh, and then the album after that, right in my head, okay. that was only about a year. It's we did it to ourselves. You hear this record companies all the time. It's like, oh, we had our whole lives to write our first album, and we had nine months to write our second album. Yeah. You know, it was kind of like that with us. We had some momentum. Indie rock in the mid late eighties, like that. 87, 88, 89, this was leading into the grunge thing. Oh, right. So DIY rock bands were a really big thing all over the United States yeah, at yeah. the time. And I mean, there were a lot of them. There were DIY rock bands in every city. Um, well, take a drink. You need a drink after yeah. all this. Yeah. So... You've covered a lot of the uh, the evolution of the band. You're in the late 80s now. You guys are sporadic. You just released the other album. Were there any other albums after that one? There was, uh, yeah, uh, there was Riot in My Head, yeah. which was, again, completely produced in Pittsburgh. And now it's, we went back to that album. We went back and revived a couple of songs. Uh, we revived a couple of covers that we had been playing oh. out. So Slow Down, the Beatles song, yeah. is on Riot in My Head. Okay. And the song Riot in My Head is basically a riff-based country song that Bruce made up some, you know, funny lyrics to. Right. Um, so that was a little bit looser. That was more a little bit like Psycho Daddy. We were trying to be like, we were trying to make our big artistic gotcha. statement with All Psycho right. Daddy. Right in my head was a little looser. Then we did another album, uh, half part with Dave, and by this time my studio was up and running yeah. here. So, uh, but I didn't have a very big room. So what we did for uh, the fourth album, the fourth and final album, was called Board Ninety Two. But it came out in 93. Okay. Uh, uh, anyway, and that was one where we recorded one side with Dave Ernie in Pittsburgh. Okay. But pretty much a hit and run kind of session where we just laid down the tracks and mixed and everything was over and done with in a very short period of time. Yeah. And I remember I traded Dave Ernie a Telecaster for the studio time. Wow. Um, and and uh, and the other half, we we tracked at Keith's, okay. which was in Raven. By the right, time. so they had the big room right next door. Um, you know, we had the nice big room for tracking, and I mixed it. Oh, cool! At my own studio, All right. and that actually led me, uh, yeah, about ninety three, ninety four on. You know, the scene started cooling off. That's what I wondered, yeah. The scene started cooling off. DUI roadblocks were starting to come in. Yeah. Um, a lot of the factors that limited, um, you know, that that limited audiences for bands at the time. So we kind of decided around 94 or so, we kind of decided that we would play four or five times a year okay and if we played four or five times a year and not more we could get 300 people to come out each time we play right right you know and the really ridiculous big dogs crowds at goofies that yeah. we had that was in the you know that was in the later days right and that was again that was people were going to see by that time we were a known commodity. People were going to see, you know, come the to show. See us. Yeah, right. Come to see the monkey act. Yeah. So you, uh, you mentioned. So you're near the end, or maybe you are at the end of the dogs, and you start your own studio. 
What was, uh, that, what was that called? I had a, I didn't, I, it was called Mr. Dub okay. for a while. Mr. Dub, and I still use Mr. Dub as a password occasionally, <laughs> you know. But you record uh, My Three Scum there, you record the Go-Go Rays, it was, the Shrugs. They, it was my, it was, I moved in 91, I moved to a split ranch house on a kind of an odd lot with no neighbors up by Perfect. the reservoir, up by the Arlington Reservoir in yeah. ne- like South Erie near Glenwood. Yeah. You know? And because of this, and, and I had a family room that was like three quarters underground and a two car garage. Yeah. So that became the studio. Cool. And I had a, a, a half inch 16 track that I had bought from Keith. Yeah. And a Mackie 32 8 board, uh, which was you know the state of the art kind of thing for back, sure back then. Yeah, it was in a big family room, and there was a bathroom and a closet in the family room. So those were the like isolation. I put this stuff, yeah, right, you know, foam and all, over, and those yeah. became the isolation cabinets for amps. Gotcha. And I had a laundry room in the back of the basement. So if we needed a base amp with isolation, we could use the laundry right. laundry room. The drums were just, I put them right, I just moved the cars out and, and, and right set the drums, rolled out a carpet. I had a carpet rolled up on the ceiling. hooks, you know, up on the ceiling. Sure. I could bring that down, roll it out, and... and Hmm. Run my snake and yeah, I mean did lots that for... of lots of stuff. I did that yeah. for quite a period of a period of years. Yeah, um, my first serious project was generic grass, oh. which was a bluegrass. Band. Right, right, sure, I've heard of but that. a really a really good bluegrass band at the time. They had a couple of players that were really great. Yeah. Anyway, I did I did that. I did a bunch of one-off kind of stuff. I did a lot of little recording jobs for for various people, recorded demos for some solo, you know, solo artists and that kind of thing. Now, the Shrugs was at the time like a truly unique band. Sure. Because they were all just super talented guys who kind of rubbed each other the wrong way. Uh, so it was very similar to the dogs, yeah. the sort of dynamics within within the shrugs. When I recorded the shrugs, we recorded the tracks in an afternoon. Overdubs took maybe another couple of days on and off afterwards. Took a whole year to get Eddie and Tony to agree on a final mix. Oh, wow. I mean, it was just... They would come up, oh, I loved it. The clock was running, you know, Eddie would oh, come sure. over, run up some right, time, right. undoing what Bill <laughs> did the last week. So I was, I, and, and finally, finally, it's like Bill Cotter put his foot down and he was like, hey, this is just costing us too much money, yeah. you know. We've got to agree on something, let Tom do his job, and, <laughs> and, and that will be the... And I tell you, of anything in the music realm that I've ever done, that I'm very proud of that record. I think that oh, cool is um, it's like a power pop record. Yeah. What are you doing these days? You hinted that you're playing with Bruce a little bit. Are you playing any music these days? Uh, I'm still have, a young guy. I have a oh god yes. I uh, I play every Wednesday at the Villa Tavern in Cambridge Springs, in a kind of a pickup band, with some of the guys from Sam and well with Sam and Frank. I play with Sam Jack and Cermak Frank. and Jack doesn't come out not anymore. anymore. I know he used Jack, to do that. Yeah. Well, Jack has dad responsibilities now that's right lots of them so yes. jack really can't do that right. anymore uh sam frank lately a drummer jim popesky who's an old eerie guy from way back okay who's been living in memphis for quite a few years it's like an open mic with a house band i was gonna say that's been going on for years Ten years yeah, yeah right right so i become a part of that that's I'm a keyboard player. Oh, okay. All right. And you know, I kind of decided I played 
keyboard on the side all the time. And okay. I played keyboard on some dog songs. We always had a keyboard set up on stage. Sam played some, right. I played some. We had a lot of, you know, we had a lot of different stuff we did there. So, you know, the WXCS thing, I joined because there's never a keyboard player. That's what I discovered when I moved back to Erie the last time. Not like you got to open stage things. There's like 25 guitar players. Right, right. All turned up to 10 and all playing at the same time. <laughs> But there's rarely a keyboard. That's a good point. So, yeah, right. you know, I, I and my keyboard chops have improved a lot since then. Cool. Yeah. And yeah. I, and I, uh, I wanted to very quickly come back to when I finished with the bands. Yeah. Uh, I, okay. I also had this Monday night, started out as a Monday night jam session. It's the Monday night misfits. Okay. And it is me. Ray Wesolowski, who plays banjo and Harmonica. does a lot of open mic, yeah, he does a lot of open mics. Julia Hamilton, who's a really good, both in the jazz kind of vein and the folk country kind of vein, really good singer. Okay, Don Dabrowski playing lap steel, nice, and uh, and uh, Dave Schroeder of PACA as the drummer, okay. And we practice at PACA, at PACA because Dave, you know. But now that was never really supposed to be an actual band. But that has gotten to a point where we've gotten pretty good. We're looking for gigs cool. now as a band. And then um, a, a while back, Lisa Rhodes, who's from Erie. Uh, Lisa Rhodes was in a band, Dogtooth Violet. Okay. With Mike Graham of Graham's Youth Records sure. and Tom Arndt, the yep. bass player. You're playing with her, so too. So Lisa sure. and I have a duo. And Lisa is a really great singer with a lot of presence. What kind of stuff are you playing? Um, what we're, I'm playing electric guitar. Okay. Because what I've discovered, you know, and I wish more of the duos around here would do it. Like, you can be quieter with electric guitar than you can with acoustic. You really can. Mm, I mean, okay. you could be, I can go from very quiet, delicate, finger pick kind of style to very loud, almost punk rock. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we're trying to explore. The songs with Lisa are, I would say, you know, a little bit campy, are they originals? garage punk kind of songs. A few originals. Okay. Mostly, mostly we're doing. Mostly we're doing covers, but we're doing like very interesting. We're taking the cover very far away sure, from the right. song. What? So anyway, I mean, we're get, we're playing like at a. We're just starting to get out. Where? What's the name? Uh, Bill's Garage. Bill's Garage. All right, not Joe's Garage. Bill's, Bill's Garage. Garage. Excellent. And well, you know, because we practiced it. Now we're branching out into other garages. But okay. Bill Nagy offered us the use of his garage to practice <laughs> over the summer. The name writes itself. While we were getting it together, and we couldn't figure out any other name. And, and it was like, how about Bill's Garage? All right. So, you know, we're going to be playing. We don't, we're not trying to do more than about an hour worth of material. Yeah, yeah. We're targeting ourselves at the opening band sure, market. Sure, sure. Like, because it's a duo, but we can be as loud as a rock band. Right, right. Um, I mean, no drums, just simply guitar. And I'm starting to use a looper so I can sure. kind of fill in the guitar parts a up. little bit. You could play a Paca. And, She's uh, playing percussion a yeah. little bit. Um, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's lots of... See, I want to play at the Warner Theater. Sure. That's my, that, that's <laughs> my thing immediately. I want to do that. And also, the thing I've been doing steadily since my film... We haven't even talked about those. Right. I made a film, Troubadour Blues, right. in the early 2000s yep. that took me all over the country shooting. I have subsequently been working on a film, Don't Give Up Your Day Job, yeah. about musicians and working musicians. Right, right. That's also taken me all over the country that I'm about to sit down and edit. Yeah. Okay. 
so uh you know i've been doing that but anyway during the pandemic i have over the years gotten friendly with norman nardini right i wanted to mention and, this yeah and you know um well yeah because there's this amazing resource yeah out there. and people in town know norman nardini uh, you know because he came up here so much and yeah. he's still I around mean, and he's hey, still he full of energy blew the roof off the blues and jazz festival. oh did he play down there he oh, okay. sat cool. in with well he just sat in for one song with one of the headliners How one did... of the blues headliners and man he rocked and he so was... you've done 14 episodes with him you just oh ended no in... we've what? done we've done a total of 32 oh, okay two hour shows okay at first it was just norman by himself and it was called alone okay and then it was called the Norman Nardini Show, and he started bringing on some of his friends yep. as guests. And what happened is we were doing, people were so starved for live entertainment right. that we were doing five, six, seven hundred dollars in tips. Oh, wow. That's great. Per show. Yeah. We couldn't have made that much money going out and playing right, during right. the pandemic. Nobody would have come out. And so, anyway. Norman has a real talent for that for that medium, just sure. that improvised comedy. You know, I mean, he's had years of entertaining people on stage. I'll include a link to it. You know, people yeah, need to check well, these out too. Yeah, they're super cool. Include your YouTube. Link. Uh, they're all page. on my. They're right. all on my YouTube channel, yeah. and I'm starting to go through those. Kind of my get warmed up to the big documentary oh, gotcha. project right now. Right. I've been going through those and pulling out. I'm going to put out a best of Norman Nardini show. Cool. Uh, DVD. Also, I'm working with Norman. Norman has two live recordings, two unreleased live recordings from the 70s, 80s, wow. and he has the Eaten Alive album, which was done as a one-off vinyl. There was never a CD of that. So he's got these three live records that he's attempting to release and capitalize on. Norman is like a phenomenal entertainer. You know, uh, uh, Mo Troop yeah. said... Mo Troop said, posted this to me, and I said, hey, can I use that? <laughs> Mo, uh, Mo Troop said um, that Norman Nardini is a big-time entertainer who never got to be a, in the big time. That's great. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it's, it's really true. You know, Norman's yeah. an old guy. He's tremendously popular in Pittsburgh. Yep. He can play two or three times a week in Pittsburgh till he drops dead. Yeah. And people will keep, you know, people will keep coming. Right. The trouble with that nationally, let's say try to promote Norman in Boston. Well, they got a guy, Willie Alexander, in Boston, who's the same kind of sure, guy. Sure, right, every place. You know, he's a very talented, entertaining guy. Everybody much beloved locally, but nobody outside has ever heard of him. And it's very difficult to promote somebody who never made it big. Yeah. You yeah. know, but I'm trying to. And I'm trying to kind of use some of my contacts that I made for that to that end. You know? Well, I'm I'm glad that we got to talk about you and your your three knucklehead buddies uh, in the dogs and everything else. And uh, I, I super, super appreciate you being here today. Uh, everybody out there knows who you are and they can go see you in some of these other projects, hopefully soon. So go out and see him. I appreciate you being here on the podcast today. Uh, it was a lot of fun. And thanks again. Thank you. All right, man. Thanks for listening. You'll remember in the intro, I thanked the JPT Foundation. Well, they allow me to host a monthly music night at their event center on West 38th Street next to Our Lady of Peace uh, Church. The Fabulous Leftovers is our house band. Uh, that includes a bunch of veteran Erie musicians who play classic rock from 6 to 7 p.m. And then each month we have at least one other local act performing until 9 o'clock. The whole event is free and it's BYOB. Uh, there is a great pizza shop connected to the JPT Hall called Pasolinqua's Pizza, so check that out. Um, this whole event also is a fundraiser for the Second Harvest Food Bank. So you can show up and just hang out and listen to the music and enjoy the night. Um, we have 
donation buckets around that you can put some cash into, or you could even bring some food items uh, for donating to the Second Harvest, Harvest Food Bank. Uh, we've been doing this for a few years now. We've raised uh, over $5,000 for the food bank. So stop out and check it out. It's the first Tuesday of every month, except for January and July. Go to the Erie Music History Podcast Facebook page to see who's playing when uh, each month. And I also post some pictures from each one of those events. All right. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it.